Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Welcome, dear reader, to Dispatches from the Armchair. There's so much news, and the world moves so fast. What are the big ideas and historical forces that are really shaping our world? Go deeper than the headlines with Dispatches from the Armchair. Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel's podcast, where we cover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945, and all the events that led up to it. I'm joined here by, yet again... What's up, everybody? Mr. Economics. Mr. Economics, and I'm still waiting for us to come over some economic content, because it's been a while, but... You know what? Not this one, but... In what is a four-part series, uh, for the audience to know, this episode that we're going to be covering, well, the podcast discussion we'll be covering, is on the Siege of Tsingtao, and there's another three episodes to come to cover my World War I in Asia series. You don't have to watch one or the other, but uh, it might help. Please do. And please, if you're not already done so, subscribe, leave a like, uh, comment, do whatever you got to do to help this small, pathetic channel as I struggle against the Goliaths amongst YouTubers. Uh, get good that's all i can say and stating that this episode will be coming out because we are filming this way in advance this is going to be coming out when finally some information is going to be coming out so lo and behold you're probably here from kings and generals you probably heard uh maybe the first episode of the podcast series of which i'm the narrator so that's the pacific war podcast week by week if we're keeping the same title that i think we are this puts me in an awkward place. So as you can see, there are basically two Pacific War podcasts. One that's much larger and has a lot more behind it over at Kings and Generals, of which I'm part of. And then this little one, I don't really know what we're going to do from here on end. But we're going to try and keep it going as we have been with, you know, discussing the episode that came out. Yeah. Well, for those of you who are from Kings and Generals or those of you who aren't, you know, I've always tried to represent the non-historian views for some of these episodes. Because, you know, not everybody's a history buff. Not everybody uh, enjoyed it, at least earlier on. So, if you want the idea of what somebody who has no idea what they're talking about looks like, it's me. I think the average YouTuber is probably not a history buff either. You know, a lot of people just watch history videos because they're interested in, uh, well, World War II, for example. Most people are interested in the war. Yeah, maybe there's a specific event you're interested in. A person, a figure, a ship, a town, whatever it may be. But hopefully some of the questions I asked or some of the stuff we talked about clears that stuff up for you guys. And as we've said in the past, if there's any questions or things you'd like us to go over or more details you'd like to know, feel free to leave a comment. Put it in the comments. And we'll uh, we'll try and take a look at it. But uh, it's good to be back. It's been a while. Yeah, it uh, it has been a while, (laughs) mostly because of uh, Kings in general. So uh, what can I say at this point? By the time this has been filming, I've written a few scripts for Kings and Generals, aside from their Pacific War channel that will be premiering. It'll probably be in the second week by the time this video comes out. Um, boy, uh, we have written months and months in advance of stuff that I probably can't say because I'm under an NDA, but uh, it's going to be exciting. The animators at Kings and Generals are magicians. I've seen things I couldn't even imagine on YouTube. It actually beats most history documentaries on Netflix at this point. So a lot of exciting stuff is coming your way on their channel. But please subscribe here. <laughs> yeah, if you prefer the uh, stick figure animation that... Uh, I'm good at stick figure. I, I'm really the, good. The, that we do over here, this is this is the channel for you guys. If you like the scuffed stuff, the, the, this is it. <laughs> yeah. As XQC would say, it's, 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 it's scuffed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very scuffed, but uh, we appreciate the support either way. So let's get into this bitch. All right, the siege of Tsingtao. Which is not actually called whatever you just said, apparently. We were talking about it before. It's mispronounced by all Westerners, and it's stuck to this day. 
that's why I'm just not going to try. The, we're going to stick with that town for now and uh, go from there. But uh, we were even talking about the beer a little bit earlier. Oh, yes. I had to. I didn't have a chance really in the episode to talk about the history of a beer that I actually drink anytime I go to a Chinese restaurant. I really do like the Tsingtao out beer. It's amazing. And it's refreshing, too. It's a... Uh... It's lighter a little bit. I it's really lighter, and I had to look up myself. So I went on the official website, and I forgot to buy Tsingtao beer before this podcast, so pretend we're drinking that right now. But the official website lists the, the history as it unfolded. Mm -hmm. uh, and the beer is actually misnamed because of the way Westerners pronounce yeah. the name of that town. Yeah, it shouldn't be pronounced that way, but it, it's inevitably what it is today. So, um, actually, you know, I did an episode... It's actually kind of appropriate, because this channel is pretty legendary at mispronouncing oh, things. Yeah. Uh, Papa? Quoi? Can you go and buy me a croissant? A quoi? A croissant. Non, mais ça va pas, non, t'as vu comment tu parles? Un croissant? Pas un croissant? Croissant. Un croissant! If you want mispronunciations of names, places in China, although I think I'm getting better in China, but Russia, Everywhere. Germany, Russian, China, Russia, oh, you on, name it, we've mispronounced that. everything. But anyways, but, so you give a, I'll give a little <laughs> brief history of the beer. So um, as we saw, even in my previous episode with the Boxer Rebellion, there was two German missionaries that were uh, murdered when there was the anti-Christian revolts going on. Uh, it was the Jui incident of 1897, which they were killed. So that, you know, sprang on this whole thing where all the countries were trying to fight for concessions because they wanted to grab pockets of China, but they were kind of terrified about holding them because you had to defend them against these everybody, were, the boxers that were, you know, killing everybody. So uh, Germany was the first one to do something and they took concessions in Shandong province. So when they leased it for 99 years, which they didn't get their, yeah, they didn't get to hold it for 99 years. So I guess... I wonder if China ended up paying them. No, I don't think China paid for it. I Anyways. highly doubt it. Yeah, so they kind of got screwed on a deal there, if you think about it. But uh, when they took the Shandong province, they decided to build a port city because that's what everyone was doing. So uh, Britain, you know, they built up Wei Highways, port city. Um, Russia built up Port Arthur. And it was really a means to, you know, control the Pacific Ocean because this is in the day yeah. that naval fleets control everything. So Tsingtao was a port city made by Germany. Uh, the same way the German cities were built. So it would have been quite a... I wouldn't call it an eyesore in China, but it would have been very would interesting. Have been, it would have looked out of place, for sure. Oh, yeah. The brickwork and everything, they would have... Apparently, they were quite... From reports I read, uh, the Chinese locals were pretty fascinated by how it looked. Because it was pretty exquisite. Yeah. Well, different building styles. Uh, you know, so they definitely would have built it kind of in their style. But it's... That, that was a great sentence. Sorry. Brain hasn't woken up yet. No, different building styles, but, uh, you know, they really went out of their way to kind of make it German, too. We were talking about the, the way they named, you know, they, they renamed a bunch of areas, towns, hills, things like that. Yep. All German styles. Three uh, The three defensive hills they named, you know, uh, Moltke, after the famous uh, general. Bismarck. Uh, Otto von Chan. Bismarck, if you guys are German buffs, you know who he is. Yeah. Had the warship named after him and everything. Very, very well known. Most in influential German. person in history, you could argue. And uh, Iltis was the uh, other third defensive hill. So there's all famous uh, German people. But that's what all countries would do because they love to label things. Yeah. So, yeah, so we have Germany who comes into possession of this port town, which, like we said back in those days, very important for everything for trade, for supplies, for. All kinds of things. And it wasn't uh, just a port town. Because of the Boxer Rebellion that unfolded two years after they got that lease, they realized, you know, oh my god, we need to protect this. Uh, particularly from the Boxers. So it was fortified basically to defend itself against any insurgents, like a mass number of Boxers coming in. So this was fortified quite heavily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had some pretty uh, pretty modern guns when the, the, the siege will happen. So uh, there's a reason why the Japanese took a licking during this. Yeah, and they definitely did, but they, they still came out with the, the W, so to speak. And uh, at the same time, I just want to bring up, because I know it's so confusing for people to understand, but at this time in history, just as World War I hits, Germany has a, a smaller colonial empire compared to you know Britain or France. They've got a few places like in the Pacific Ocean, so you know, like the Marshall Islands, the Caroline Islands, Palo Islands, Nauru, all these places the Spanish used to control, but when the United States beat the hell out of them in 1898, they just sold them off to the Germans. And the Germans had some, uh, a few places in Africa, but nothing compared to France and Britain. 
they were late to the game, so to say. And when World War I happened, it was kind of a supernova in the East, to make that Dan Carlin reference, and people like the Japanese saw all these territories that couldn't possibly be defended, like Tsingtao, and uh, they were up for grabs. Yeah. I think, uh, I believe, you, before we started this podcast, you had a question about why would Japan fight Germany or even take this? Well, you had mentioned that they got a little bit of a nudge from the British, but, uh, you know, and we'll get into it more near the end of the episode as well, as far as the relations between Japan and Germany during World War One, because it get, you know, obviously most people know that they were more or less allied in World War Two. So to hear that Japan's attacking Germany in World War One and taking over its territories is a little bit weird. So we can end... But mainly the question was to ask, the, the, what was the motivation for taking this town uh, mostly? Because we talked a lot about, in previous episodes, the taking of Manchuria. But mm-hmm. Manchuria was a very important territory at the time, yes. both for passage, for um, supplies, railways, all those things. What was the big deal with this port town at that time? Pretty much nothing. What ended up happening is interesting. So the British had asked for very specific assistance. They wanted just a minor amount of assistance to hunt down the German East Asia squadron. So these were some cruisers and a few merchant ships that were armed. The only reason the British asked for this is because they were a nuisance. A few ships in the ocean could actually raid and take down much of your merchant ships, your troop ships. It could do a ton of terrifying damage and a lot of the soldiers for Britain were coming from Anzac. Or India, for that matter. The Indian Ocean was also part of this. Uh, They were terrified of what the Germans could possibly do. And the Germans did do stuff, and that's actually the next episode. We won't get into that. So when the Japanese saw this demand for assistance, they went much further in scope. They sent an ultimatum to Germany and declared war. And then they suddenly attacked Tsingtao. The British were furious. In reality, most European powers were extremely angry this happened. They did not want Japan anywhere close to China because they had holdings in China. They were all super concerned that Japan did this. But what could they do? All of them were stuck in Europe fighting a world war. Japan yeah. knew this. So it was Japan was an opportunist during this. Okay. And what did Japan get out of it? It'll be in other episodes because this episode is a little bit unique where it stops right, you know, in 1914. We'll talk about China and Japan in future episodes, but Japan did not stop with Tsingtao. They would infiltrate the Shandong Railways, taking control of that, looking at local municipalities, trying to tax the local population of the Chinese, and they were trying to just put their foot down and take what is Shandong Province, basically. Much like uh, the European powers had already done, like Germany, at least for 99 years. They were just trying to take what Germany had. This did not go over well with the European powers. Uh, Obviously not Germany would be pretty pissed, but uh, even Britain had, you know, sent them secret messages saying, please stop, please stop, please stop. And Japan would uh, further this by trying to take some Pacific islands, and Britain would demand openly in front of the public that they stop. Which humiliated Japan, mind you. I'm wondering if Japan maybe had a different viewpoint, more in the fact that they didn't see the islands exactly as owned or occupied by Germany. They just figured they were kind of neutral up for grabs and was just trying to put their foot down to say, I'm the big dog in this area right now at the time, and I'm going to take control of all this because even if that town wasn't worth anything, if you say they kept going farther after the whole Changdong province, it was probably worth a fair bit of money at that time. Everything is worth money, and China... To be honest, there was opium trade still. The Japanese were trying to deal... Like, that's a minor issue, mind you, but there was all sorts of ways to make money in all of this. Uh, With the Pacific Islands in particular, the rationale was military. They wanted to make a strategic area of defense. Uh, I could probably, when I put out this episode, I'll show So military outposts uh, on the the islands and whatnot. But even Tsingtao itself, it's a port city. It's actually of a great benefit, because if your ship goes into a port this like time it's basically protected from a lot of different factors when your ship's at port it's actually very dangerous and it's hard to come after it because you're anti-aircraft weapons all that even in world war one like planes are brand new but there there was an understanding of how immense ports were and having a port right beside the other ports such as way i way or port arthur was essential i mean the japanese wanted port arthur this whole time and to get things out it's just like it's a cherry on top of the sundae okay 
And uh, I don't want to get into it too much, but it was all part of a plan to subdue China. Okay. There's an underlying plot, basically, to make China a protectorate. Okay. And this really helped them, what they're going to do later. So the city wasn't necessarily as big or as big in trade for Port Ar as Port Arthur and other um, ones, but at the yeah. same time, it was a port city. So it gave them fortification for their navy, yeah. gave them a foothold it's in China. It's not Shanghai or anything. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, but, it's a decent city. But gave them a foothold in China. Yeah. And, uh, all right. Okay. And so they're kicking down the doorway. I thought it would be interesting to bring up because in the past with these podcasts, it almost turned into like me summarizing what the ep what happened in the episode. And I don't want to do that. I want to elaborate on things the audience might have wanted to hear and we couldn't talk about and all sorts of things like that. And I mm -hmm. thought it was interesting to mention something about kind of what happened with Tsingtao because I had to end this in 1914. Um, anybody who knows the World War One history knows that Britain had um, a terrible reputation by the end of the war for making promises to every single nation they could to get them into the war or to get favors that would help them during the war because Britain just wanted to, you know, win. And by doing so, they promised most of the time territories to be given over to another nation and they would promise other nations those same territories. For example, when it comes to the Ottoman Empire, Britain promised uh, the Jewish people, a new nation that became Israel later on in history. They offered the Arabs all these concessions, like to take parts of the Ottomans. They offered France and Italy parts of the Ottoman Empire. They basically were just kind of cut up the empire and they basically told people they would give them the same territories. And mo more famously, part of the Aust Austro Hungarian Empire, they were going to give Italy a territory there, which doesn't end up happening because it would contradict one of their other promises. And they got in, uh, a lot of crap for that and it. Ren, it basically, that's how Mussol well, that's how Mussolini comes about. But uh, Tsingtao is one of those places where Britain did this uh, strategy. So when the Japanese came in and said they're going to go to war and they attacked the city, the British freaked out. They wanted to make sure that China remained neutral. They didn't want China getting into a mess with the rest of the world and to keep them content. So they said to the Chinese, don't worry, we're going to give you back Shandong province. This is a good thing. So don't worry about those Japanese. They're not going to get it. You're going to get this province by the end of the war. Don't worry. As the years unfold, the war gets worse for the Allies. The British need more help from the Japanese. And in order to ensure that help is given to them by the Japanese, they promise them that territory. So uh -oh. when you go to the peace table and you told two nations kind of the same promise, and that's what happened to Britain, mind you, for a lot of places... Yeah, it was and I'm pretty sure awful. they weren't happy with splitting that piece of candy in half and sharing it. Oh, no, the Japanese got it right away, and then the Japanese lost it, which was kind of ironic. So it was no one was really that happy in the end. But it's a, it's a, it's a strong case to make that a lot of people don't think about the Pacific when it comes to World War One. They just rightfully, I mean, a lot of it happens, of course, in Europe and all that, but the Pacific had its own uh, fun times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you're promising land to people that you don't own or control, it's oh it's yeah, brave. Uh, you you might not know this. It's famous. Um, so you you know that Russia went through a revolution and became a communist state. This happened right. during World War One. When the Russian uh, communists took over, they found all the secret documents that their government was signing with countries like Britain. So all these deals and these promises that Britain had with Russia were immediately made public. Oh and boy. the whole world saw them, and a country like the Ottoman Empire, who saw a document listing all of the territories it controls and how it's going to be cut up and given to all these countries, the Ottomans were um, shocked, to say the least. I believe it. So, let's get into Japan actually taking this uh, taking this city. They, they took some pretty hefty tolls, I think. Yeah. Yes, they did. Um... One thing of note that I liked, and anybody who can Google it, it's kind of interesting, because, you know, uh, we're, I'm, I'm a specialist on the Pacific War, not necessarily World War I, the Pacific, although it's not, there's not so much information to go into, but this uh, siege saw a lot of firsts in history. It's pretty interesting. So it was the first encounter between the Japanese and German forces, in which they fought. It was the first Anglo-Japanese operation of a war, in which they were allied. It was the first time there was a air-to-sea battle in history. So, as you remember in the episode, the seaplane carrier, the Wakamiya, launched a farm mine, well, a bunch of farm mine seaplanes, which looked like something out of, like, Da Vinci made. I don't know yeah. if you saw the pictures. It's like, 
these guys had a lot of cojones to get in these planes, all right? And, uh, you know, they failed to do any damage to the other ships, but they tried to hit ships with bombs. Literally, they're throwing out of a plane. They be throwing Molotovs out of a plane at a boat, but good luck. It's all the power to these. These guys were badasses for that. Um, and lastly, as I kind of made a joke in the episode, um, the German pilot, Gunther Ruschau, if he alleges that he shot another pilot in midair with his pistol. If this is true, it's technically the first aerial victory in human history. I am doubtful, but, uh, you know. Yeah, I gotta kind of call bullshit on that one. I mean, no, no, no disrespect to Germany and their pilots, but if in the 40s you could shoot a guy plane to plane with a pistol... That guy's the best gunslinger in the world. Never mind the aerial victory. In Battlefield can... 1, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That 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 was my thought, too. And uh, actually, on the topic of Gunther, uh, Gunther, you know, after having to learn a little bit about him, he's a badass. Like, uh, we're talking about, you know, throwing the bombs. So, Gunther, in his plane, when he was trying to fight off the Japanese, apparently he would have to improvise and make these bombs using coffee cans with scrap metal and dynamite in which he would take it and then just you know throw it on a ship and try to like damage firecracker it. style just <laughs> you have to have a lot of big balls to do that <laughs> that's impressive and you know the the history of i, I could only summarize just don't it. drop it in the bottom of the plane because then you're so toast but it, it it's a crazy story because once it looks like you know since i was going to fall the governor, you know, he tells Gunther, here's a message, please send it to the Kaiser and say that we lost the city, we tried to fight as best as we could. So, Pushao, he makes his way home, but, like, he goes on this incredible journey around the world. It's yeah. insane. So, I have it here. By August of 1915, he spends nine months in Shanghai. He goes to San Francisco, to New York, to Gibraltar. He gets captured by the British. He's sent to London as a POW. And then he... And I don't, I don't know the whole story, but he plans this great escape where a bunch of prisoners get out. He escapes to the Netherlands, and he finally gets back. He finally gets back to Germany, and then he serves for the remainder of the war in 1918. Uh, although when when the war looks like it's going bad and Germany's surrendering, he didn't. He personally did not take part in what's kind of the uh, God. What do you want to call it? The, the mutinies that happen in uh, Germany. It's another story. And uh, then he becomes a famous air explorer, and he tragically dies. Uh, he in crashes a plane in crash Patagonia in the thirties. Hmm. But uh, yeah, and to till today, uh, Argentina has him as like a local hero. Guy's like the first around the world in eighty days kind of guy, but not yeah. quite. Yeah, it's just a random pilot in that little Da Vinci flying machine. <laughs> Oh, by the way, uh, since we were just mentioning that he had to dispatch, you know, the fact that Tsing Tao, like, fell uh, to uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Uh, a little bit about Kaiser Wilhelm II, it's kind of funny to mention, but we had a little discussion before we started this podcast that, you know, Kaiser Wilhelm II sent a message to, you know, Alfred. Oh, like, dear. Yeah, yeah. This guy was I'll, very special. I'll, I'll read this message because it should be famous. He said to the governor of Tsingtao, quote, It would shame me more to surrender Tsingtao to the Japanese than Berlin to the Russians. What I find is so kind of hilarious about him saying this is, even by his day and age standards, he was a ridiculous racist. He's the guy that created what, it, what we know today as the Yellow Peril. It was fabricated by him. Uh, he's the guy that prodded you know his cousin into the russo-japanese war saying to his cousin you're the great savior of the white christian race you have to defeat the japanese because all of the asian people are going to come and take us down yeah and then he makes this kind of like foot in the sand moment where he it's almost like he's saying you know you're the alamo all of you have to fight to the death they're is he insane? Like, which, which is kind of the best part because as we when we get into the battle, it's or the battles themselves, they defended it very very well. Oh yes, considering they were ridiculously outnumbered and apparently outsupplied by a lot. But I love the fact that they just didn't listen to him. As soon as they knew it was lost, they were like, "Yeah, fuck this, we're out, we surrender, we're gone, we retreat." Like they they were like, "Nope, not gonna happen." I did want to find the. Uh refreshing my memory on the casualty list so let's see i have the actual numbers so germans 
The Japanese had 733 dead, 1,282 wounded. The Germans had 199 dead with 504 wounded. And looking at the numbers off the top of my head, they were outnumbered 6 to 1, Japanese to the Germans. Whew, that's, yeah, that's steep. And it all comes down to people not understand, even... There's a conversation about how the Russo-Japanese War showed what World War I would be like, what it looks like to run into machine gun fire. And the Japanese knew this. A lot of the people in this battle actually had fought in the Russo-Japanese War. So even knowing what it was like, those casualties, like, oh, this is a this is a grimy World War I battle. I'll bite it's a little bit smaller than what you see in Europe, but it's the same kind of impact that you see in Europe. These people didn't really know what could happen with these weapons, and it's it's tragic. Yeah, and let's not forget the uh, the Japanese had so much firepower, but even with that, like you said, cover fire thousands and thousands of rounds a day just to advance the trenches, yep. but still, they're absolutely taking it in the teeth. It was because of the defensive structures of this place, because they had these three hills in front of the main city, which was walled. It, it's a very strong city. and hmm. I mean, they couldn't even take out the fleet in port for most of the time. There's only a few ships. They were too afraid that, well, I mean, the Japanese didn't want to really, how to say this, they they put it, they, they didn't bring the A-team. The A when it came to their ships, they actually brought some, like, older, kind of obsolete ships. They didn't want to, like, you know, waste anything, because you, you can run into sea mines or something. You don't want to, yeah. uh, a really expensive ship to die just so you could take things out, not to, you know, make fun of the city or anything. So, eh, yeah. But the bombardments, yeah, I mean, it goes without saying, they really unloaded on them, uh, yeah. Can't even imagine what it was like for the Germans. Probably couldn't sleep for <laughs> the all the days. No, you said it was seven straight days or something. They bombarded them and advanced the trenches until they finally got there. It really, unfor un what's unfortunate for the Germans is the Japanese are one of the few nations on earth that had practice for this because they had recently fought the Russo-Japanese War, which is almost identical to this one. You got barbed wire coming into it. You know, machine guns had finally had, was the first time you really saw machine guns in action, pillboxes and stuff. It's terrifying. Uh, actually, I did want to bring up something, and it would uh, it would kill me not to, because I know a lot of my, I hope a lot of my audience are, are Chinese. Uh, we didn't really get to talk much about the Chinese that suffered during this, because they're never talked about. Um, the, yeah, it's basically their territory that's being fought over, and they're just like a bystander almost. It's uh, it's really, it's almost it's insult to injury that someone like me makes a video like this and I, I fall into the same fallacy that everyone else does um, the the nation of China declared neutrality during World War one uh, Japan did not respect that <laughs> Japan was going to come to Tsingtao one way or the other and the Chinese just there's nothing that they could do they just tried to sit back and like let these two nations fight on their territory and the Japanese went out of their way to promote the idea of being a civilized nation towards the Germans. They made sure to abide by the Hague Convention, to do all international laws. As we see with the surrender, they treated them unbelievably well, with respect. Mm. It's not just because they were German. If it was any Western nation, they would have done this. As they marched on the Germans, they plundered, murdered, and raped many Chinese. They did horrible horrible atrocities that are identical to what happened in the first Sino-Japanese war. It's basically the same thing. The Chinese sent reports of this internationally and the Japanese told them that it didn't matter and that that was regular conduct amongst what happens during war. But they had never done anything of the such to the Germans. I have a few notes here on things that happened. According to reports made in Shandong province, the number of cases of property damage numbered 6,200. Many of the reports indicated Chinese civilians tried to stop the Japanese soldiers from plundering their houses or from assaulting their women, and they were either shot or bayoneted. So a lot of the deaths that happened is because of this. A flow of, you know, inhabitants around the Shandong province ended up running into Tsingtao just to flee the violence that the Japanese were performing upon them. Uh, not to mention there were, there were incentives. Uh, the Germans were extremely terrified of the idea the local Chinese would help the Japanese to take them down. So they uh, they would pay the workers an extravagant amount of money. Extravagant, back in the day. It's 50 cents if you're unskilled, 75 cents if you were skilled. If you're a mechanic, you get 80 cents a day. And 10 cents for lunch for everybody. 
but that back then was probably amazing because it actually incentivized a lot of the Chinese locals to uh, to come into Tsingtao. And uh, I have, uh, how many of them were, according to records, at one point there was over 7,279 Chinese that remained in the fortified city, uh, probably during the battle. Upon which, you know, most people had fled the province because the Japanese were doing all this atrocious stuff. But I just wanted to make the point that the... The Japanese publicized this so much internationally about how much they were civilized and how much they were doing the gentleman's war. And, you know, whenever you actually talk about this this siege, it's always brought up like it was a gentleman's act. Look at the painting when the surrender. It even looks like they're shaking hands and, you know, all this stuff. They never talk about how the Japanese treated the local Chinese population. It was atrocious. Even at Tsingtsao itself, I think like 69 Chinese people were butchered and murdered. Yeah. And they weren't at war. These are not... No one yeah. was treated none as a soldier. None of them was armed. None of them was... Uh... Even if they were, it's a neutral country defending yourself. Wow. Yeah. But that's just, you know, it's part of the... Uh, the ongoing uh, relationship that China and Japan will have. <laughs> that'll yeah. really boil over during World War II. Yeah. Now, speaking about national relations... Explain to me a little bit more in depth. I know we've touched on it in some of our other episodes, but just briefly. The the deal with Japan and Germany, because, again, I don't understand how Japan can attack with whatever you want to call it, a German colony or a German-owned territory, yep. take it over. Well, Germany, I still think, got the better of them in terms of casualties. They still took some losses. It's not like Japan just walked in and said, okay, you can give up, now go home. They still took quite a few of them with them. So how do you go from that to them being allied in the Second World War? So, in World War One and just before it, the Japanese were divided when it came to Germany. I would actually argue that the majority were pro-German. Germany was a model upon which they wanted to build their own society because Germany had fallen into a militaristic kind of governance. It, it, during the war, it actually kind of changes. It becomes more militaristic and actually becomes a military dictatorship under Erich von Ludendorff for a while. The Japanese, they're on, you know, yes, they're allied to the Allies and they're doing their part. But to be honest, most of the Japanese as a population, they really like the Germans. And a lot of them wrote in certain newspapers that the only reason why Germany existed after World War I was because of their militarism, that it had saved them that it was the only thing that actually kept them together. And the Japanese continued to model themselves after Germany, after the war, and even more so. Uh, anyone who knows kind of their history of the Pacific War knows people like Hideki Tojo were uh, pretty radical about fascism. Um, they really adopted as much as they could from the German system of Adolf Hitler. And uh, it would just be further and further until you get to the 40s. They inevitably fell, fell down the same loopholes the fascists in Germany did. And um, other than that, um, the way the Japanese saw it, the Germans had a, what, what they would call a Bushido death during World War One. They had fought a good fight and they went down well. So there was little to not respect on their viewpoints. And they had, since the 1880s, you know, Germany was one of the main backers that trained their military in the first place. So Japan was always eager to learn from uh, particularly the Prussian model nothing really changed during world war one it was unfortunate they had to face each other but you know as we saw at the end of my episode when they had the prisoners look at how they treated them that went beyond and be above anything you do with prisoners considering how we've seen they treat others for sure uh, oh god it's a bit of a contrast yeah if they were uh, <laughs> if they were chinese it would not be the same that's uh, it's pretty clear mm. But uh, it, it's a complicated story how we go from World War One to World War Two with Japanese-German relations. They get really buddy buddy in the twenties, uh, and it's it's really it's the um, the army and not so much the navy that get they fall in love with the Jap with the uh, with the German military and a lot of their uh, generals like uh, General Tomiyuki Yamashita, he goes to Berlin, has an affair with a German woman for many years. It's an interesting story. And uh, he falls in love with uh, the Blitzkrieg when he learns how Germans combine armored warfare with the infantry and the air force all at the same time to complement each other so that they can like attack a spot and then like outflank yeah. everything. He, he learned from the Germans and it had a profound impact on him 
and he would take it into the Pacific War when he could. He was the only Japanese commander that got his hands on some tanks. I'm getting a far, far into the future here, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, and lastly, I wanted to touch a bit, you know, you, you said Japan saw Germany as kind of, you know, fighting a good fight and this and that. We talked a little bit about surrender tactics mm. when it came to, uh, you know, Germany running out of ammo or nearly <laughs> running out of ammo yeah. in their fortifications. You were talking about some interesting techniques they had uh, when it came towards that. So, yeah, we had a conversation before we started this podcast where Justin was bringing up, you know, like, the fact that they really unloaded on the Japanese, and it, it's true. Uh, the siege of Tsingtao ended because they ran out of ammunition. That's the truth of it. I mean, they only had so many shells and everything. Um, the Japanese were so obsessed with making sure they treated them perfectly because they really wanted to be treated like a civilized nation. Basically, the way you can look at World War One for the Japanese, it was like a beauty pageant. Japan wanted to look magnificent because they had so much to gain at the peace conference that they needed to be acknowledged as a great power, as the same as all these quote-unquote civilized nations, uh, which it would bite them in the ass at the end. But if you compare this to how they normally go about their conduct, it's interesting. Take, for example, uh, in World War II, sorry, the Pacific War, the Battle of Hong Kong. Um, many of the Canadian and Indian forces would unload all of their clips on the Japanese who were invading, and then they would surrender. Uh, the Japanese saw this like a few times and then they would just execute everybody because under normal conditions of war, if you unload your full, you know, machine gun belt and then surrender, it's kind of seen... I admit that's a bit... It's, that seems like a bit of a dirty tactic in the sense that we know we're going to lose, let's just take as many people as we can with us and then hold up the flag and try and get out of this alive. It, it, it does it, seem a little scumbaggy to me, I'm not going to lie. It's a ba it's also a bad example because on top of that, the Japanese during the Pacific War were performing war crimes every time that they could. And well, Hong Kong is a horrible place for this where they executed particularly the Indian soldiers and did atrocities to them. So regardless of them unloading the clips, they probably were rightful, right to, to unload the clips of the Japanese, mind you. But uh, if you look at, so uh, let's say the Russo-Japanese War, they wouldn't have treated them as such like they did the Germans. If they unloaded their clip and then surrendered, it's a, kind of a no-no, but it's murky waters when you talk about this. Yeah. It's like one of those unwritten rules. But even though... You should though... have like, a bullet in the chamber left to like say that, you know, oh yeah, I surrender. Yeah. But, like we said, you know, they, they kind of let them off the hook in that sense. And when it comes, I mean, we said we saw the numbers before. When it comes to total casualties, Germany got off not bad. Oh considering, yeah, no. uh -huh, considering Germany. how badly they were outnumbered and outgunned. That's and you look at the prisoners of war. They ended up marrying Japanese wives and having a life. You know, they the band, yeah. the orchestra band, toured all of Japan in their military uniforms. They were beloved by the Japanese. I loved it because I mean, like, well, of course, the Germans were renowned for some of their music talents. Like, it would have been amazing to hear it too. And uh, yeah. so you start off as a German POW and end up in a almost circus act kind of band and touring the world, living a perfectly normal life. Yeah. And uh, I almost put in some memes for this episode that I thought were so funny. One of the most famous memes when you're talking about Japan during World War One is you think about World War One, a Serbian nationalist kills the Prince of Austria-Hungary, which makes. Germany go to war with Russia, but it has to go to war with France. And then England gets pulled in because Germany attacks Belgium. And because England's been pulled in, suddenly you as a Japanese person, you're fighting Germans in China. It's like the most bonkers like diagram of weird things going on. Yeah. And by the way, on behalf of maybe you guys too i do want to thank you for starting to put diagrams in your videos yeah. when you're listing fleets and battalions and things like that so i can follow along who the heck you're talking about and what you're trying to pronounce it it does help me a lot i hope it helps you guys a lot um as bad as my stick people are i've learned a lot from just watching kings and generals content now <laughs> there's no well I, I am never going to even remotely touch where they've come in the world they are arguably i think not to like 
give anything away. I think they're going to even go past YouTube soon. I, I honestly see them being like a dominant historical channel. They got something that the other channels don't got. Not not to, uh, to down punch on the other great history channels. I, I love Alternate History Hub, by the way. It's one of my favorite channels. But uh, my God, the Kings and Generals, they got so much under their belt. And they're going to be coming out with so much more stuff. And aside from the Pacific War, there's a lot of cool things that are coming out. It's really interesting to see the animators, what they're working on. 3d animated 2d animated they you know they got both they got artists oh my god an episode came out um a few weeks ago world war one alliance systems i wrote that one i had no idea until it came out that they had got these two artists to draw all these fantastic pictures of like Otto von bismarck and stuff i was like oh my god this is amazing it's really cool i was really happy uh, to be part of that when we get around to that period we have to do a piece on Otto von bismarck because that's a guy that intrigues me yeah i think you can argue like the one of the biggest arguments in the world the most important person in history is christopher columbus not because he kind of founded the new world but he unleashed kind of a cataclysm of which disease made to the new world and we call it the columbus exchange and all this but anyway Otto von bismarck is a character who's also kind of notoriously known as like one of the most important people in history because he made this web of political alliances that only he could really control and it was in the best interest of just germany in the end but the outcome is hilarious because in his old age he gets sacked by kaiser wilhelm ii we're talking about because kaiser wilhelm ii's advisors say y you can't become a great leader with this guy he he's overshining you like he's this bright star you need to get rid of this guy he's too big and as soon as they get rid of the master the puppet master of all these alliances world war one happens because his little mechanism, that powder keg that he built, got set, fused, and blew up. And yeah, I would love to do an episode on Otto von Bismarck. I'm not a freaking German historian for any... I, no, neither you, am I, but uh, I didn't see any warship named Wilhelm II, but there is one called the Bismarck, so... Is there a freaking warship called Wilhelm II? Probably there is, I just... Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I'm not a naval well, I'm pretty historian. sure the Bismarck would kick the shit out of it, so... Oh yeah, the Bismarck is definitely one of the coolest ships ever made. We both play World of Warships. <laughs> By yeah. the way, they put submarines in that game. Yeah, yeah you told me about it. Yeah. I'm still not playing it again. It's not yeah. happening. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, man. World of Warships. What are you, what are you doing, brothers? What are you doing? Please yeah, sponsor yeah. this. He, 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 he's still <laughs> I love submarines. I love submarines. They're great. Please sponsor me, World of Warships. Anybody. World of the Hill Take, World of Tanks, World of Warships, World of uh, Horses. Doesn't matter. Hey, War Thunder, I'll do it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're kind of to the end here uh, what else to say i mean i kind of said at the beginning uh the future of i mean this channel is going to continue to do all these episodes all the episodes you see i'm going to be doing them not, no matter what i'm not going to be doing them week to week like kings and generals because my god there's a lot of people working on that that's how they manage that yeah we have real jobs sorry oh they do too <laughs> well they're not all full time i can't say anything but yeah they're they're hard workers but uh i'm gonna be doing event to event and i'm gonna be doing my own thing um i might be working on scripts for them but i got my own ideas and i'm completely different from them they i would call them yeah, more because they don't have me hello exactly. this is uh yeah. i you know people who watch my stuff you know i love my cinema and it's like a bad thing as a historian to say that like, you're using like cinematic footage from movies but i love it i love showing it because i find it's entertaining people who don't like history get more involved and they're just like it's more visually you know scrumptious and i can't animate <laughs> so yeah. it's the only way i can get away with it so i'm gonna be making event by event episodes and we're gonna be covering the full pacific war for god knows how long i can get this going hopefully it'll uh increase with i i can't i don't even know what to expect when the other podcast comes out because i know the audience for kings and generals is enormous but uh, we'll see if there's a lot of you watching this oh god <laughs> i'm sorry for this low quality weird discussion podcast thing that we do uh it's going to continue as it is like this and depending on your comments what you like who knows maybe the maybe the, the unforgivable speakeasies will come back oh dear that suddenly disappeared off my youtube please, channel please no not again you're still in the pod cast sphere so audio listeners can still listen to them as far as i know right now either way we always appreciate comments and feedback about the direction of the channel about what you want to see about who you want to see or not see please set me free tell me you don't want me anymore please and, leave uh, comments hey if you're if you're from thailand 
tell me you want an episode about how Thailand gets involved in World War II. If you're from any Vietnam, Cambodia, like if you want all these other histories just before World War II, World War One, I'll do any special episodes. I'm up for any ideas. Yeah, we're running out of out. foreign names that we can't pronounce, so please uh, throw oh, a few of them our way. God, I just wrote a script about Thailand, and I'm sorry, those town names are really difficult. I'm so glad I'm not the narrator <laughs> for that one. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, so next episode, you said we're dealing with some Navy stuff. Oh, yes. So the following episode will be on German Raiders of the Pacific. So uh, I think I said in the Battle of the Siege at Tsingtao, the German East Asia Squadron that Japan was asked to take care of mm. left. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, it's not even the Why? Japanese. The Japanese don't really even go after them. It's the British and uh, other people who end up. Yeah, I, I, I think we can all agree that Japan had another agenda when uh, they agreed to help Britain with this. They got distracted by possessions of the German yeah, Empire. Well, the next episode we'll definitely see uh, what happened with them, and we'll get into that. Yeah, that's going to be a Navy-filled episode. It's going to be uh, different. Excellent. I'll wear my sailor hat. You should. You actually have one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> If this video gets enough likes, maybe I'll buy a sailor hat. All right. Yes. Please like and subscribe. Leave a comment. It helps us out the channel so that I can someday pay for enough seeds for my two parrots that you probably heard screaming in the background. They got really noisy for a while there. All right. So this has been a Pacific War channel. Not the Pacific War week by week. Over and out. Take care, guys. <laughs>